before we begin the service, uh, as a courtesy to the family, I would like to ask if you would check your cell phones and make sure that they are turned off. Thank you. Would you please join us in the singing of A Mighty Fortress Is Our God. <laughs> Family and friends, we gather today to glorify God by remembering one of his dear children, Mr. Herman Grady Phillips, Jr., Phil Phillips. We come here to mourn because mourning is an important part of the grief process. But another important part is to share memories. And we come especially to celebrate a wonderful life, well lived, a full life. Mr. Phillips's life certainly exemplified his strong faith in Jesus Christ. 
and he lived the teachings of his favorite verse from Micah 6, 8, in which the reader is taught to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. I thought a lot about this day for a long time. And I decided if I were ever asked to take a part, I was going to quote a scripture that I feel, felt like would have epitomized Mr. Phil Phillips. We all had our, learned a lot from him in our lives. And this one verse, to me, captured him. And it's from the Beatitudes. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be known as the sons of God. Mr. Phillips always impressed me with how he could bring calm and reason in any situation, and I witnessed that so many times. Phil Phillips was the man that every man would like to be like, if they could. And he knew the secret of that, and really it's no secret, but to follow Jesus Christ, to walk humbly with the Lord. And that's exactly what he did in his life and legacy. Your attendance today and the attendance last night at the visitation, which was, was phenomenal, gives testimony to the impact of the many lives that he has touched. But I have a feeling that that high number is only the tip of the iceberg of the number of lives he's impacted and will impact because of his faith in his Lord. We welcome you to come and celebrate this life because this is a service of a life, of a celebration of life, and we welcome each and every one of you. And as we begin this service, may we go to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, we come before you today to praise you as our creator and the giver of life. We thank you, Lord, for the faithful life of Mr. Phil Phillips, and that you've prepared a place for him as you've prepared for each one of us who have accepted your gift of salvation and everlasting life. Lord, I pray that you'll put your great arms of comfort around the family, around Miss Hannah, the children, the grandchildren, the nieces, nephews, the, the whole family, Father, that you just look after them and give them your peace and presence, not just today, but in the days ahead. And finally, Lord, as we remember the life of Phil Phillips, may our greatest remembrance be that you loved him, that you still love him, and that you love each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, we offer this prayer. Amen. Reverend Ogburn said something that was completely true, is that when you think about God's word, it's easy to be reminded of Phil Phillips to many of you, but for the rest of the time together we share, I'll be calling him granddaddy because that's how I knew him. There's many scriptures that point to him because he lived for the king. He lived for Jesus. And so as we come to God's word, it's really easy to find parallels between him and what Christ called us to do. And so we go to Psalm 1, a psalm that was read with granddaddy to granddaddy many times because it emulated it. It reflected who he was and what he did. And so I want to read to you Psalm 1 as we celebrate, as we look forward to celebrating what God has done in the life of granddaddy and continues to do through his legacy that we'll talk about later. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor seats in the seats of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on it he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its seasons, and its leaf does not wither. In all he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. And Granddaddy was 
righteous. He was a tree planted by streams of water, living water, Jesus Christ, who he was grounded in, who allowed him to produce fruit in season and out of season. It's because he is that tree by streams of water, founded and fueled by the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we can hear a song that we're about to hear now that says, it is well with my soul. Whatever happens to us, it is well with our soul because we know there is hope in the gospel of Jesus Christ. May we enjoy as we hear this wonderful song, It Is Well With My Soul. It is well with my soul. 
that we come here and we're able to celebrate when the world is not able to celebrate in times like this because of the gospel, it is well with our souls. Amen? Amen. It is well with our soul. When I was thinking about exactly what it is that we were going to look at for a moment as we came to this time of celebrating and remembering, I came first to Psalm 116.15. And at first I tried to steer myself away from this passage because I've, I've spoken on it once at a very special funeral to mine. And I wanted to steer away from it. I didn't want to do the same thing. But as I kept thinking about it, I kept remembering that a life lived for the gospel of Jesus Christ is a life lived for the gospel of Jesus Christ. These two funerals that I will, this funeral that I get the chance to honor to be a part of today is wonderful because it celebrates a life that is lived for the Lord. It reminded me that as I looked at this passage, Psalm 116, 15, that when we are followers of Jesus Christ, it is lived out in different ways. We are not the same. Every one of us is not identically the same. If we were, we'd be a bunch of boring people. But the gospel is lived out differently through different people. And so as we come to this passage in Psalm 116, verse 15, I want to read this to you, and you might think, why are we reading this? But I want to take the time to explain to you exactly why we are looking at this one verse and the wonderful, wonderful counsel of God's word. And this is what it says. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. I'm going to say it again because I want that to be in your hearts and in your minds. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Let's pray together, everybody. Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to be here and to celebrate and to rejoice a life that was lived well because a life that was lived for you. This morning, Father, we have the privilege of joining together and worshiping you. We have the privilege of opening up your word and remembering that precious in your sight is the death of your saints or your godly ones. And so, Father, as we unpack just for a short time what that means, may we remember and as we remember the life of granddaddy, may we be pointed to the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ, because he did it so well. Father, we love you. We thank you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If we're going to look at this passage together, and we are, we have to ask ourselves what the psalmist David meant about the saints. Who is he referring to when he talked about the saints? Who are the saints in Psalm 55 defines them a little bit differently. It says the faithful ones who made a covenant to the Lord by their sacrifice. And so if we ask ourselves the question, who are the saints? Then we realize the saints are the people that are connected to the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ. They have covenanted with God. They are his people. They are his children. The saints are his children. And they know him in a covenant way, a special way, a way that is close, a way that is endearing to the Father. That is exactly what being a saint means. It means being connected to the Father through the Son. And so as we begin to look at this, we realize that Granddaddy was connected to the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ, for many, many, many years. As a boy, he came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, but just as each one of us, as we come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, we're not supposed to stay there in our immaturity. We're supposed to grow in sanctification and maturity in who the Lord is. And that's exactly what Granddaddy did. In fact, he reminded us and told us that when he went to Mars Hill College, it was where the Lord began to really reveal himself to him in a mighty way. And his faith grew in wonderful and magnificent ways. And it did not stop continuing to grow in wonderful and magnificent ways. Yes? He displayed it in his life. He displayed it in who he was. He displayed it in his legacy, which we'll talk about in a minute. And guess what, everybody? He's still displaying it right now, but he's doing it in fullness before the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. He never stopped growing in maturity. And that should be an encouragement to you and to myself that we should never stop growing in maturity and sanctification of the Lord. If we ever get to the point that we say, this is just how I am, we're not going to change, then we have missed the whole point of the gospel. Because the gospel brings the dead to life. And it changes us. And it's a continual process of change that does not stop. No matter how old we get, we are still trying to look like Christ. 
What does it mean to be a saint? It means to be covenanted to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It also means in that covenant, you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, which means you believe in his gospel. You believe in him. And this is the wonderful thing about granddaddy is that every time that granddaddy would talk to any person, they would see the gospel displayed through his life. He wanted people to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, he wanted people to know the gospel of Jesus Christ so much that 13 years ago, granddaddy, before he was even potentially my granddaddy, he gave me a set of cards that said, this is the plan of salvation. This is how you share the gospel with those that you will come into contact. 13 or 14 years ago, he gave me these cards. He wrote a message at the bottom. There were several things at the top, but I want to speak his words to you because these are very literally his words. He says, this, what I'm giving you, is the only plan for salvation. This is the only plan that those can be saved. And so what I want to do is we remember granddaddy and his life as he displayed the gospel is I want you to hear from his words, the gospel of Jesus Christ, because even though he has departed from us, his life still displays the glory of God. Amen. And we get to hear his words through that today. And so let me share with you exactly what he wrote to me 14 years ago as he was wanting to impress upon me the wonderful privilege it is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, Chris, I want you to understand that God loves you dearly and wonderfully and completely. He quoted John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish. God's love for you is great and it is wonderful and God wants you to be with him. God desires a relationship with you. And he said, but even though God desires a relationship with you, there's something that separates you from the Father, and that is your sin, Chris. That's your sin, everybody else who is here listening to what Green Eddie said through his words. It's our sin that separates us from God. But he wanted me to understand from Scripture how that sin looks. And he said, Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And because of that, we are separated from the Father. And there is nothing that you or I can do to earn our way back to the Father. We can't be good enough. We are coming and celebrating a life of a good man. Would you all agree with me on that? Amen. We are celebrating the life of a good man. But him being a good man is not what allowed him to be a covenant child of the Father. What allowed him to be a covenant child of the Father was the response to man's sin, which we see that sin's penalty is death. For the wages of sin is death. You and I deserve to die forever. But that's not what God gives us because God sent his son, Jesus Christ, so we could not earn our way to heaven. We can't earn our way back to God. God did something for us in sending us his son. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his love for us, for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We can't earn our way back to God, but guess who can bring us back to the Father? The Son, Jesus Christ. Because, and this is something that many people forget, everybody, and I want to say this to you because I don't want you to miss this. This is one of the important parts of the gospel that oftentimes many people could not even articulate if I asked you what the gospel was, is this, that God made Jesus, <clears throat> who had no sin, which means Jesus didn't deserve to die. He made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So that he took our sin, he took our death, and he took our punishment upon himself so that we could be brought back to the Father. If you miss that part of the gospel, you don't know what the gospel is. And because what Christ has done for us in his death and his resurrection and him defeating death, then we have the opportunity to be with him as granddaddy labeled it faith's door. Faith's door. If you have faith, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you will be saved. I don't want you to get confused, though. You can't just have a knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. You truly have to be, as we talked about earlier, covenanted to him, have a personal relationship with him. It's not just knowing that Jesus is God's son. You have to be connected to him to have a saving relationship with him. That's what faith's door is, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's a wonderful promise, is it not? Granddaddy, Psalm 116, 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. We can call him a saint because he knew the gospel. 
And they called him a saint because not only did he know the gospel, but he wanted the gospel to be proclaimed to every person he came in contact. And the gospel is what he lived out. The gospel is what we loved in him because he displayed the love of Christ. And so if we ask ourselves, what does it mean to be a saint? Then we are reminded that granddaddy told us all throughout his life what it means to be a saint. Yes, to trust and believe, truly believe. In the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you will be a saint. That's what it means to be a saint. No one makes us a saint. We're not sainted by any church or any being. We are sainted because we are a child of the king. And that's what it means to be a saint. And that's exactly what granddaddy wants us to see and to know. And the wonderful thing about the saint is because of the gospel, a saint never tastes of death. Because Jesus is Lord. And he rose from the grave and he defeated death. Saints do not know death. Precious in the sight of God is the death of his saints. We know who saints are, but we begin to see that God has a special name for his saints and he calls them precious. He calls them precious because they, we, if we trust in the gospel of Jesus Christ, are his children. Can you call, well, sometimes you can, but majority of the time, can you call your children anything other than precious? Because you have a love for them that withstands anything else. They are precious in your sight because they are your children. God has a special name for the saints, and because they are connected in the gospel of Jesus Christ, he calls the saints precious. They are cherished to him. We are lovely to him because we have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. We are lovely to him. We are his precious children. That's a blessing, right? It's a blessing to be able to be called his precious child and to be known as a saint before him because we have trusted in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Granddaddy lived out a life of trusting in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And because of that, when the Lord looked at him, the Lord said, you are my precious child. Precious in his sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. You see, granddaddy, not only was granddaddy precious to the father, but the father was precious to granddaddy. Granddaddy rested in the arms of Jesus in this life. And when granddaddy breathed his laughs on this side, he rested in the arms of Christ when he stepped into glory. When he left the land of the dead and went to the land of the living. If we think granddaddy's life shared forth who God is in this life, I can only imagine what it's proclaiming right now. Where he is before the king of kings and the throne of thrones, and he is delighting in the Father. What else makes the death of the saints precious to God? These are short things that I want you to see and I want you to understand as we celebrate the life of granddaddy. We know that at death, it's precious to the Lord, to his saints, because it terminates suffering and pain. You and I both know that every time that we take a breath in this world, we are in the process of getting closer and closer to death. It's just what happens. But when the saint goes before the king of the kings, all the suffering and the pain is over. And he is at rest. It's precious in the sight of the Lord because his people are at rest. Death is not the end. Death is no abbreviation. Death is the fulfillment of life to those who are precious in the sight of God. Did y'all hear that? Death is the fulfillment of life on this side of glory for those who are precious in the sight of God. It's not an end. It is a fulfillment of what has been hoped for since granddaddy began to trust Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of the saints because when we depart from this body, where do we go, everybody? If we're a godly one, if we're a saint, we go to who? The Father. Immediately. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Death is precious because we are immediately, immediately in the arms of the Father. Lastly, saints leave a legacy. That word is not something I throw around loosely because legacies can be both positive 
and bad. You and I have both been around enough people to know that you can leave a negative legacy. It's not true with Granddaddy. Granddaddy left a legacy. A legacy is Reverend Ogburn said that every man could emulate and be pointed to the gospel and to the King of Kings and what life was truly about. He left a lasting legacy that will never tarnish and it was not a legacy of the things of this world. It was the things that are imperishable. The things that he has entrusted to his family, the things that he entrusted to his wife, the things that he entrusted to his children, and by proxy, not only through his children, but himself also entrusted to his grandchildren. Things that are never tarnished, they're imperishable. Things that you can never let go of because they never fail you. Granddaddy left a wonderful, wonderful legacy. And we know that because his father left him a legacy. I had the privilege of when we came into town, I went out to the place that we will go next to the graveside, and I looked at Granddaddy's daddy's place of rest, his body's place of rest, and there was an inscription on his marker, and this is what it says. It says, with courage that never failed, with kindness that knew no limits, with loyalty that was constant and beautiful, with faith that never doubted God's protection and care, he faced life's problems as a man without fear and above reproach. I hope you catch the, the magnificent statement in that. His father left him a legacy. He followed that legacy. Granddaddy leaves that same legacy. If you read those words with me, if you heard me read those words, you realize that that's not just telling about his father, but that's also telling us about Granddaddy. And he leaves that same legacy for his children, his grandchildren, and everyone who came into contact with him. Because he lived a legacy that was wonderful and faithful and good. And because of that, his son and his daughters, they have that same legacy to fulfill. And they have that same legacy to live up to. And then his grandchildren have that same legacy to live up to. Living in such a way that you leave behind a lasting impression that points people to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. May that legacy continue and may it never stop. We realize that part of Granddaddy's legacy was he was the rock. He was the centerpiece. He was the rock of the family. He was what allowed the family to exist and to breathe and to do. He was the one the family looked to, as Reverend Ogren said earlier, that gave peace that calmed situations and allowed the family to move forward in what they needed to. He was the husband of one precious woman for nearly 62 years. One of the neat things about being the husband that he was, this is something that all husbands should look at, he cherished, he adored, and he took care of his wife for 62 years. What a wonderful thing to see in a world where husbands don't know how to treat wives, where husbands don't know how to cherish their wives. This family has seen an example of what it means to cherish and to honor and to love your spouse with complete fervency and fervor. And Grandma did the same for him. And it was never doubted that either one of them loved each other in a wonderful way that pointed people towards the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that being said, one of the granddaughters, Caroline, is going to read to you a poem that was read at Grandma and Granddaddy's their wedding nearly 62 years ago, the same place where many of Granddaddy's children and grandchildren have also been wed in the very same place because we hope, it is our hope, because I'm one of those that was married in that same place, it is our hope that we can live a life where we love our spouse like Grandma and Granddaddy cherished and loved one another. As Chris said, this poem was read at my grandparents' wedding almost 62 years ago. My grandfather carried a copy of it with him in his wallet, and my grandmother also carries a copy in hers. How Do I Love Thee by Elizabeth Barrett Browning, an excerpt from the sonnets of the Portuguese. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach. When feeling out of sight for the ends of being an ideal grace, I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need, by sun and candlelight. 
I love thee freely, as men strive for right. I love thee purely, as they turn from praise. I love thee with the passion put to use in my old griefs, and with my childhood's faith, I love thee with a love I seem to lose with my lost saints. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life, and if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. There was no doubt that they loved each other in a way that that poem signifies. And because of that, people were pointing to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He was a father that left a legacy as a father, and his children know that better than anybody else. He was a father that his children could watch, exemplify, and show generosity to whoever who needed it. There were stories that were shared specifically by his children that said there were many times when people would come to their house or their front door and it would be needing something. And granddaddy would go to the door and greet them and say hello to them. And as he greeted them and said hello to them, one of the children were beckoned to go get his wallet from his bedroom where he kept it because he was a generous man, not just with his children, but everyone that he came into contact with. And because of that, his children have learned what generosity is in a way that unless you see it exampled in your father or your mother, you will not know. You have a wonderful example of what generosity looks like because he left a legacy. You have a wonderful example of what thoughtfulness looks like because of granddaddy. There were stories that as we spent time with the family that recounted there were times that granddaddy would go and sneak gifts in different places and leave notes of encouragement just for the purpose of wanting to encourage another person to be thoughtful in what he did for other people because he was and is a very thoughtful man of God. His demeanor, in general, left a legacy. If anybody, especially your children and grandchildren, knew anything about his demeanor, one of the things that were very important to him, that when you met a stranger or anybody and greeted them, you need to greet them with a firm handshake. You need to look them in the eye. You need to stare at them and let them know that they are worthy of your respect and your time and your attention. Because his demeanor was a man of great vigilance and valor. He taught that in legacy to his children, his grandchildren, to anyone who came into contact with him. They learned from their father encouragement, what it meant to encourage others. He was a man who oftentimes encouraged without any other type of push besides it was coming from himself. He wanted to encourage and lift up and build up other people. And if you met him and spent any time with him, you began to see that in your time with him as well. He left a legacy to his grandchildren that's apparent in things that we just said, but we also see that as he was a granddaddy to 12 grandchildren, that he left a wonderful legacy for them to look at and to see and to follow. Let him each of the grandchildren know that they were special and dear to him, that even though there was a, a large cast of 12, that you each had a special place in his heart, and he took time to let you know that he had a special place in his heart because he was your granddaddy who loved you dearly. He took time with you, even when other things were going on, because he left a legacy of how to love your children and grandchildren. There are many times when we begin to see what Granddaddy would do in action and word for his grandchildren, and that will never be forgotten, because the legacy that he left will never be forgotten, because he is a saint who is precious in the sight of the Lord. You, each one of you in this room, whether you are a family, a wife, a child, or grandchildren, You've been touched by his legacy. You've been touched by his life and who he was. Because a legacy doesn't just stay with your family. A legacy is left because of who you are. He was a man who was wonderful, who did wonderful things for the kingdom and for his family and for everyone that he came into contact with. And because of that, you and I have to ask ourselves a very important question. What kind of legacy are you leaving? When you see men and women who leave strong and wonderful legacies, if you're not pushed to ask yourself the question, what kind of legacy am I leaving behind for my children and grandchildren, for all those that I come into contact with, then you've missed the mark. So each one of us right now should be asking and evaluating our lives and saying, what kind of legacy do we leave behind? Will someone be able to preach our funeral one day and celebrate knowing that the legacy that we left behind pointed people to what was truly important and nothing else? If you can't answer that question well, 
then it gives you a wonderful chance to change. And the only way that legacy is going to be achieved is if you first put your trust in Jesus Christ. You will not leave a lasting legacy that is imperishable unless you first trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And if many of you said, well, I've done that, well, then it should be shown forth in your life. And if it's shown forth in your life, then when you breathe your last on this earth, you will leave behind a legacy that will withstand time. And because of your legacy, more and more people will know about the kingdom of God. What kind of legacy are we leaving behind? His children need to ask themselves that question. His grandchildren need to ask themselves that question. And every person that sits in this room and every person that even met him needs to ask themselves the question, what kind of legacy do I leave behind? Because the only chance for you to change the legacy is now. Once you die, it's too late. Your legacy is left now on this side of glory. How will you live your life? In a way that points to the King of Kings or a way that points anywhere else? What does it mean to be precious in the sight of God? What does it mean to be precious? What does it mean for death of the saints to be precious? It means that we are his children and we live for him each and every day. Which is why we can come to this place and instead of grieving as the world who has no hope, we can grieve as one who have a hope of glory and we can sing and we can stand and we can shout joyful joyful we adore thee because we adore him we adore the king we adore him in fullness and granddaddy's life helped us adore the king in fullness of his glory yes let's stand together everybody as we join together and sing joyful joyful we adore thee It's a privilege. It's a privilege for us to be here today. It's a privilege for us to be able to sing joyful, joyful, we adore thee, even at a time when we should be grieving in such a way that we cannot stand. Because we have joy. Because we know that Granddaddy rests with the Savior. And we can also have that same hope if we trust and believe in him. Now to the Father, who is able 
to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine according to the power that is at work within each one of us. To you, Father, be the glory in Christ Jesus and in the church, both now and forevermore. Amen and amen.
Everybody else, please come close around the family. <coughs> okay. Before we go to the Lord in prayer, as an opening prayer, I've chosen a special prayer that is an ancient prayer written by William Penn. And I believe it's one that Mr. Phillips would have liked and um, it's based on John 14 when Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. And he talked about going to prepare a place for us. And so let us pray. And I've adapted it for him. Our Heavenly Father, we give back to you, O God, Mr. Phil Phillips, whom you gave to us. You did not lose him when you gave him to us. And we did not lose him by his return to you. Your Son has taught us that love is eternal and that love cannot die. So death is only a horizon, and a horizon is only the limit of our sight. Open our eyes to see you more clearly and draw us closer to you so that we may know that we are nearer to our loved ones who are with you. You have told us that Europe, you are preparing a place for us. Prepare us that where you are, we may always be. O oh, dear Lord of life and death. In Jesus' name, amen. I like to read one of the most comforting scriptures in the Bible. And it comes from Romans uh, 8, 28 through 8, 39. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So we gather here at this place, we realize as we talked about together earlier in the church, that granddaddy is not here. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We realize that when we come to this place, we are knowing, though, that every time we come to a cemetery, and especially every time we come and visit Granddaddy's place here at this cemetery, we know that one day, as First Thessalonians tells us, that Christ is going to come back. And when Christ comes back the second time, he's going to sound the trumpets. And when he sounds the trumpet, this body that we see right here is going to burst forth from this grave. And his body will be reunited to his soul, and he will live in the new heaven and the new earth forever both body and soul. May we get comfort, y'all, when we come to cemeteries. May we get comfort in knowing 
that one day, for those who are precious in the sight of the Lord because of the gospel, that one day this ground will be completely disturbed because the saints will be called home and they will be with Jesus, with the Lord, forever and ever. So we come here at this final act remembering that one day Christ will call his saints home completely and holy. And what a glorious day that will be for all of us. But may we not forget that every time we come here, that that is exactly what we look to. That we realize that we are committing granddaddy here, knowing that Christ is going to return. And we proclaim. We proclaim. He proclaimed in his life. And we proclaim his death. That Christ is king. And he's coming again. And he's coming again to do just what he said that he would do. So today... Granddaddy, we commit you to this place, knowing that you will not stay here. Knowing that just like Christ was risen from the grave one day to you will rise your body from the grave. Christ is our forerunner. He's the first fruit. If we want to know what it's going to look like, it's going to look like Christ when he rose from the dead. And we will be with him forever and completely. I want to read to us Psalm 23, y'all, as we begin to continue to to mourn and to grieve, but we mourn and grieve with a hope that he's with the Savior forever and ever. And one day too, if we trust Jesus, we will be as well. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, you are mighty and glorious. And it's at times like this that even though we grieve, we get to just comprehend and begin to see even how mighty and glorious you are. When we come to places like this, Lord, we realize that you will come again. That as your son has promised, he will come back and take that which is his own. And that's exactly what your son Christ will do. And he's going to come back and take granddaddy when it's time. To be absent from the body now is to be present with you. But forward we long for the day for when both body and soul can be with you forever. Thank you for that promise. Thank you for that gift. Thank you for that thing that we cherish. And knowing that you are always faithful to fulfill your promises. Father, as we finish our time today, I want to pray for the family. I want to pray that you will undergird them with your strength and with your power and your might. I pray that you will lift them high, that you will set them on places that need to be set. They will not rely on their own strength, but they will hold firm and hold fast to you, the rock. Help us to hold fast to the rock that cannot be moved. Thank you that Granddaddy was a picture of a rock that was on this side of glory is as movable as you can get because he pointed us to you. Undergird this family. Allow this family to see you in every breath that they take, every action that they take, and everything that they do, so that you will be glorified much in this day. Thank you, Father, for your love. Thank you for your gospel. Thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Colossians 3 says, If then you have been raised with Christ, Seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with God. When Christ is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. And may the Lord lift his countenance upon us and give us peace that withstands everything else. Amen and amen.
show generosity to whoever who needed it. There were stories that were shared specifically by his children that said there were many times when people would come to their house, their front door, and it would be needing something. And Granddaddy would go to the door and greet them and say hello to them. And as he greeted them and said hello to them, one of the children were beckoned to go get his wallet from his bedroom where he kept it because he was a generous man, not just with his children, but everyone that he came into contact with. And because of that, his children have learned what generosity is in a way that unless you see it exampled in your father or your mother, you will not know. You have a wonderful example of what generosity looks like because he left a legacy. You have a wonderful example of what thoughtfulness looks like because of granddaddy. There were stories that as we spent time with the family that recounted there were times that granddaddy would go and sneak gifts in different places and leave notes of encouragement just for the purpose of wanting to encourage another person to be thoughtful in what he did for other people because he was and is a very thoughtful man of God. His demeanor in general left a legacy. If anybody, especially your children and grandchildren, knew anything about his demeanor, one of the things that were very important to him, that when you met a stranger or anybody and greeted them, you need to greet them with a firm handshake. You need to look them in the eye. You need to stare at them and let them know that they are worthy of your respect and your time and your attention because his demeanor was a man of great vigilance and valor. He taught that in legacy to his children, his grandchildren, to anyone who came into contact with him. They learned from their father encouragement, what it meant to encourage others. He was a man who oftentimes encouraged without any other type of push besides it was coming from himself. He wanted to encourage and lift up and build up other people. And if you met him and spent any time with him, you began to see that in your time with him as well. He left a legacy to his grandchildren that's apparent in things that we just said, but we also see that as he was a granddaddy to 12 grandchildren, that he left a wonderful legacy for them to look at and to see and to follow. Let him each of the grandchildren know that they were special and dear to him, that even though there was a, a large cast of 12, that you each had a special place in his heart, and he took time to let you know that he had a special place in his heart, because he was your granddaddy who loved you dearly. He took time with you, even when other things were going on, because he left a legacy of how to love your children and grandchildren.
As Chris said, this poem was read at my grandparents' wedding almost 62 years ago. My grandfather carried a copy of it with him in his wallet, and my grandmother also carries a copy in hers. How Do I Love Thee by Elizabeth Barrett Browning, an excerpt from the Sonnets of the Portuguese. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach. When feeling out of sight for the ends of being an ideal grace, I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need, by sun and candlelight. I love thee freely, as men strive for right. I love thee purely, as they turn from praise. I love thee with the passion put to use in my old griefs, and with my childhood's faith, I love thee with a love I seem to lose with my lost saints. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life, and if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death.